Hi, good afternoon. Uh, this is Mark Heisman. Uh, I'm with Matrix Systems. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start the webinar here. Um, i just like if uh, I've got everybody on mute, so if you could uh, just save your questions uh, towards the end of the webinar and I'll be happy to answer them. Um, if you guys can't hear me, uh, please let me know by sending a chat message here. You should have a, a chat window on the side that you can do that. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Today we're going to do alarm monitoring in the Frontier Access Control System. Uh, and we're just going to talk about some of the capabilities of uh, the Frontier Access Control System in regard to alarms and alarm monitoring. So the first thing I'm going to do is just give a quick explanation of, of who Matrix is. I think most of uh, the people on the line know who we are, but just a, a really quick explanation. Uh, we've been around for uh, 30 plus years in the security market, uh, manufacturing and integrating access control solutions. Um, we do consider ourselves a one-stop shop. Uh, we develop, manufacture, integrate, and support both hardware and software. So uh, the application Frontier, we do write that application in-house here at Matrix. Uh, we also uh, design our own subsystem and have it manufactured, and we do some production here at the corporate office on the subsystem as well. Um, we are an integrator as well, so we do integrate other access control products into our system, as well as uh, we do sell some, some other uh, third-party access control hardware. Uh, and then we also provide support for both the hardware and software. Uh, we do 24 by 7, 365 days a year on our support, which is somewhat rare in the industry. We do have major installations in aviation, healthcare, education, government, and industry. So uh, we've been around for quite, quite a while, um, and, and we have a lot of large installations uh, deployed. So briefly, I'm going to talk about what's new um, in Frontier. Currently, we are selling Frontier version R3. Um, so this, this is currently available. Uh, and one of the first things I'm going to talk about real quick is going to be the next level VMS interface. So uh, we have an interface to next level video management system uh, where you can view live camera feeds uh, right from the Frontier application. We can also view alarm driven, recorded, and live video. So we can uh, associate alarms uh, with video cameras to be able to uh, bring up recorded video clips of, of when alarms actually occurred. Um, we do have floor plan driven camera icons, so we can place uh, icons on a floor plan to be able to understand what the area that you're looking at is, uh, and we can control those icons and bring up live video as well as uh, um, we can do a couple other things with that as well as uh, bring up recorded video. Um, and then we also can receive analytic alarms from the NLSS gateway uh, or the next level gateway. The next level gateway, uh, it's an appliance based VMS system. Um, that actually comes with built-in analytics on it when you buy it. So we can take advantage of those uh, different analytics. If you look on the screen, you'll see I've got an alarm queue with a couple of the analytic um, alarms actually coming in the queue that I can, uh, uh, I can look at uh, the associated recorded video with those alarms. One of the other things that's new in Frontier R3 is the ability to use the Mercury hardware subsystem. Um, we, of course, have our own subsystem, the Frontier subsystem, but we can also use uh, Mercury subsystem. Mercury uh, is a company that's considered kind of an industry standard or non-proprietary subsystem uh, within the access control industry. Uh, it gives us the ability to have a wider variety of third-party solutions that we can use with the Mercury platform. Um, we can also mix our own subsystem. We can use Frontier subsystem along with a Mercury hardware subsystem both on the same platform. Uh, and we do support uh, the 1501, 1502, and 2500 Mercury controllers. The next version that we'll be coming out with is going to be Frontier R4. We have a scheduled release date of April 2014. Uh, there'll be a couple of new features in it. Uh, some of the bigger features that I'm going to talk about are going to be uh, the web client mobile solution and also multiple credentials. Uh, 
Uh, with the web client mobile solution, uh, we are going to have a web-based client. It'll be browser agnostic. We've designed it in a way that uh, you can open up that web browser um, on a tablet or even a phone, um, but we've designed it to be user-friendly for those devices as well. Uh, in the first release of this product, uh, it will be a little bit limited. It will not have the full capabilities of the actual uh, thick client, uh, but we will be able to manage badge holder records. Uh, we will be able have the ability to go into the operations screen and get statuses as well as control doors and alarms. Uh, and we'll also have uh, the ability to do reporting within the uh, web client in the first release. Another feature in Frontier R4 will be multiple credentials. Uh, this will give us the ability to assign multiple, multiple credentials to uh, one person. Um, currently, we use the badge number as kind of the single identifier in the system. So if, if a, if a uh, person has more than one credential, you actually have to make more than one record for that person. This will give us the ability to assign multiple credentials just to a person record. So this will uh, it'll it'll make it easier to manage credentials, as well as it'll uh, it'll provide um, functionality to more accurately record your records, as well as uh, prevent data duplication. So the first thing I'm going to talk about about uh, with receiving alarms in Frontier is, is just kind of some of the ways that we can actually receive those alarms. So an alarm is going to be an indication of an abnormal state that we've predefined in the system uh, that we need to know about. So the first thing I'm going to talk about a little bit is, is local alarms, uh, which are at, going to be at the actual door, gate, or turnstile, or portal. So th these are alarms that actually go out off locally at the door. The next thing we're going to go into is, is actually from the Frontier application, the various ways uh, that we can uh, receive alarms within the application. Then we're going to talk about alarm notification a little bit. Uh, and then I just mentioned on here that we will be able to use mobile devices and web browsers with the uh, R4 release. So this diagram right here I just created to show a typical alarm data flow. So right here you see the alarm is generated and I just put door force here. This could be any type of alarm uh, within the system. You know, it could be a tamper, it could be a door force, it could be in a jar. Uh, it may not have anything to do with a door. It could be uh, something where you're monitoring temperature on refrigerators, um, etc. But any type of alarm that's generated in the system, we have a couple different ways we can handle it. And we can do local alarms at the door itself, if it is a door alarm. And within those local alarms, we can either do strokes at the door or maybe some type of enunciator at the door. Uh, this is good when you want to draw attention to the actual area when the alarm is happening. We can also do send alarms to the Frontier Alarm Queue. So this is typically where you're going to see most alarms go. Um, into the alarm queue, and we'll talk about the various ways that we can uh, respond to the alarms. But it's going to be either a workstation client or a web client. And then we also have alarm notification. Uh, alarm notification is sending um, an email or maybe a page or maybe a text message upon an alarm condition. And we could have one alarm that could be configured to do you know, all of these different uh, types of notifications here. So first off, we'll get into a little bit more detail about local alarms at the door. So local alarms at the door are going to provide uh, situational awareness at the door. So it's going to physically draw attention to that area uh, for people to respond. So typically local alarms will see um, at doors that are high secure type areas. So I've, I've seen them at, at airports maybe with jetways where they have uh, very high secure doors where they'll have um, local door alarms actually go off at the doors if something is breached there. They'll use enunciators, so we could we could do enunciator. It could be a uh, an audio enunciator or a visual enunciator. Um, door force alarms, the jar alarms are typically tied to strobes or enunciators. So, so that's going to be the typical scenario you're going to see set up in these type of situations. Uh, there are different functions we can do at the reader itself um, on local alarms. So. 
uh, depending on the hardware we're using, we can uh, we can clear the alarms locally from the reader themselves if we've given those privileges out to the uh, the officers who are responding. Um, we can also arm and disarm uh, alarms locally from the readers as well. Now this is the most typical way that we would receive alarms, through the alarm queue, the database tree, and the floor plan window. So this is the main area where operators typically work in the Frontier application. And this is, uh, we'll go into any, some actual examples here in a minute, um, where I'll actually throw some alarms and you can kind of see the, the way the windows work and, and the way we receive and control alarms. Um, but it is the main area. Um, the alarm queue itself is really probably the, the main area that most operators are going to work from as far as uh, looking for status, controlling alarms, and finding information. They can also use a floor plan as well. Um, the floor plan is going to provide real-time alarm status control, and it will also give you an idea of the physical location of where that alarm is going off. The database tree uh, provides organization control and real-time status. So the database tree uh, is more of a, a status type area, I think, for the operators, but it can also give the means to provide um, a, a good organizational structure for where your alarms are um, and being able to actually find those alarms very quickly within the tree. Uh, we also have a thing called an alarm handler. Uh, the alarm handler window is a window that we can bring up once we've received an alarm that will give us the ability to do all the diff different types of uh, commands um, as far as processing the alarm. Um, there are multiple windows uh, in the ops in the ops screen. So these these uh, couple different windows that we were talking about, we can move these windows around the screen and resize them depending on the monitors that we're using. And we can save those configurations so every time we come back into the operations screen, uh, we'll be able to get the exact same view that we desired, uh, which you know, may change by user depending on what type of monitors they have and the resolutions they have. Alarm notification gives us the ability to receive emails, text, or pages alarm uh, upon alarm conditions. Um, so, we, we have a way to uh, organize this or administer this, and we do that through uh, alarm notification groups. And what we can do is we can set up groups of different users within the system. Um, we can define schedules for when they'll receive these alarms. Um, we can have calendar days as well. Uh, and we can decide if they want to get email, you know, if they want to receive an email, a page, if they shouldn't uh, receive a notification for this, or if we want to send it to their emergency contact. So it gives us a way, a, a way to organize groups of uh, users for notification. So I want to talk about briefly best practices for alarm setup and management. Um, and I tried to start this kind of from, you know, from the high level, where, where would you first start um, to set up alarms? And I think one of the most important things is defining a good nomenclature standard uh, for your alarms that's easy for all your uh, users to understand. Um, this is going to be very important, you know, so, so your operators understand specifically what they are looking at when they do receive those alarms. And uh, everything I talk about here in this list, we're going to actually go into and kind of do a couple uh, demonstrations to get an idea of what exactly I'm talking about here specifically. Um, one of the other things is def to define and assign alarm priorities. In the Frontier application, we do have the ability to prioritize alarms, and that will drive what they, the order that the alarms are seen in the queue. So if you have a very high priority alarm, you always want that alarm to come up to the top of the queue. Um, we can define action plans and associate those to alarms. So this is a good place to include your SOP procedures. It'll save you time as well as make sure that your operators always uh, follow a standard operating procedure. Alarms can be configured in the database tree as well for greater organization and control, which I spoke about uh, a minute ago, but we'll uh, actually take a look at what that means here. Um, you can use features like closure in SOPs for high priority alarms. So there's a couple different ways we can process alarms depending on uh, the severity of the alarm. So if we have alarms that are you know, a little bit higher priority, then we might decide to do things like closure or even ownership 
Um, ownership is, is a feature where basically when an alarm comes into the queue, the operator can take ownership of that alarm. And it basically means he owns that alarm and he is the only person um, actually working on that alarm. So if you have multiple queues and multiple operators receiving the same alarms, this is a good way uh, to know for sure that somebody is actually taking action on an alarm and following through with it. We also have the ability to use alarm routing for multi-building sites. So what alarm routing is going to do for us is we can define certain alarms in the system and by uh, user login we can route those alarms to different users or even to different queues. Um, we also can create multiple queues for different alarms. So that kind of goes, that basically goes hand in hand with the alarm routing. One more uh, feature we have here that I'll talk about and actually show in a minute here is, uh, is a maintenance mode for alarms. So we can actually set up uh, maintenance modes for alarms where we'll get an indication on the screen that a certain alarm um, is in maintenance mode. So if you're, uh, this is really good for when you're actually setting up an alarm and testing it or even commissioning alarm within the system. This will let your operators know that that they do not need to act on a certain alarm because it's actually being installed at the time. And then we also have alarm templates, which gives us the ability to define um, an alarm and the basic behavior of an alarm and actually apply that alarm um, more than once without having to uh, actually configure the alarm every time on some of the basic uh, uh, attributes of the alarm that are, that are going to be the same always. And then we also give you reporting capabilities on, on all of this information. So you can do alarm event reports, which is going to show you specifically alarms that have occurred by the event. Uh, they'll show you the date and the time, the name of the alarm, and they'll give you a description of the alarm and where it came from. Um, we can do also alarm history reports, which is going to give us more of a kind of total count of how many alarms we've had on certain things uh, within the system. We also have a comment and reason report. Uh, comments and reasons are basically we have the ability uh, when an operator acts on an alarm to bring up a dialog box to have them enter in further information about how that alarm was actually processed. So it's going to give us kind of a history of what the actual operator did and it's up to the operator to actually tell us what they, they had done at the time to process that alarm. Uh, and then within the, uh, the report viewer, we can also define uh, report favorites. So if there are certain reports that we run um, the same that are, you know, usually the same type of criteria, we can, we can define uh, favorites and then that way it makes it, a, you know, a lot easier to, to run reports, um, canned reports that, that we've uh, already had predefined that might be just part of our daily process and processing alarms. So right after this, we're going to start taking a look at some real-time alarms, but these are some of the best practices um, for alarm processing. Um, so priority, to always set your alarms uh, with highest priority, given priority so they go to the top of the, of the queue. Um, for floor plan auto switch, uh, so, you know, we may have some alarms that when they actually go into alarm, we have the ability to switch directly to the floor plan to show where those alarms are going off. Um, audibles, uh, you know, you can associate um, audibles to actual alarms when they come into the queue. So uh, you might have different audibles um, for different priority alarms. Um, action plans, always want to use action plans, uh, good for SOP procedures. And then also the comments and reasons that we talked about a minute before. Um, comments are great for documenting alarm responses and procedures. And then we got closure and ownership, which we talked about a little bit as well. So I'm going to go ahead and actually start generating a couple alarms here. Okay, so the first alarm I'm going to generate is I'm going to do a panic alarm, and I'm going to do a panic alarm, and it's actually going to be in this, this lobby area here. Um, so I'm going to actually have it automatically switch up. 
So that was my panic alarm, and you can see it, it quickly switched to my zoomed-in floor plan view of where it was actually at. So I defined up here in the front lobby. So this P icon, this is my panic alarm. Uh, so from here, I can act on the alarm. I can arm and disarm, um, acknowledge it, uh, do a couple different things here. I can also do the same things from down here in the queue. So if I right-click, I'm going to get that same menu that I just saw up from the floor plan as well. Um, another way we can do this is from the actual alarm handler. So if I click on alarm handler, this has got all the information to do with the lobby area desk panic alarm. So uh, I can do all the same things that I could do from the right clicks that I just showed you um, from, this, from this little GUI menu here. So acknowledging them, going to the floor plan, we can do histories, um, parental control. Uh, so I'll step through a couple things here real quick. I want to show you um, alarm history. So if I go here, right click, I'm going to do a history. So this is showing me the last 10 transactions. So when the alarm was active, when it was reset, where it's at, uh, and the username. So this is just a nice way to get a, a quick history on this alarm. Um, in real time after it's come into the queue. Uh, we can also, of course, run history reports uh, to see this type of information, but this is uh, really designed to be a quick way, um, if you're an actual operator, to get that information without having to go out and actually run a report. Um, on this particular alarm here, I can also do statuses. So a status is going to go out and show me the state of the alarm, what the alarm is, uh, the different modes of the alarm, if they're armed, um, and basically all the information specific to that alarm. I can also do view action plans. So this is, we had talked about this a minute ago. Action plans, uh, you know, best practice is to use your SOPs and your action plan. Um, so this gives my operator a specific guide of what to do when this alarm happens. So I'm going to go ahead and acknowledge this alarm. It's going to say, am I sure that I want to acknowledge this? I'm going to say yes. And so I made the comment and reason mandatory. So this box came up mandatory. So I need to actually put a comment in there before I can move on. So uh, test panic alarm webinar. So I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. Now it's going to record that, uh, that text dialog that I just entered in. Uh, I require this alarm to have closure, so I'm going to have to do, even though I've acknowledged this alarm, I'm going to have to uh, come up and actually do a closeout of the alarm to make it disappear from the queue. So I'm sure, and now it's gone from the queue. Okay. So I'm going to do another alarm here. We're going to do a, a, a BOLO alarm. So a bolo alarm means be on the lookout. Um, we have a watch window that will show you transactions. So these are going to be badge holder transactions. Um, what we can do is we can set up a bolo alarm, which means be on the lookout. Uh, typically, when people uh, swipe their badges or, or present their cards at a reader, you're not going to get an alarm for that. But what we can do is what's called a bolo. So I've set a bolo on this particular person. Bolo alarm. Bolo, alarm. Badge, reject. Badge, reject. Danger, Will Robinson. Okay, so uh, I just did a bolo alarm, and you can see right here on Jennifer, I, I created a bolo alarm. So I actually uh, had her reject at the door. I could have her accept at the door and create a bolo alarm, which is essentially going to send, you know, I'm still going to get my bolo alarm, but uh, if she's got a problem at the door, if somebody, say, uh, is forcing her through the door, um, you could put an accept on it so uh, the person uh, who was doing that would, you know, they wouldn't really realize that there was actually an alarm being sent out. So, you know, sometimes you'll see people leave these as accept transactions but send the BOLO alarm so they know there's a problem in the area. So on my BOLO alarm here, I'm going to go ahead and 
uh, view the action plan. So you can see I've got a bull alarm action plan as well. And if you look over here in the tree, I've got a red, red indication on the database tree details that shows that this is actually an alarm. So these icons here uh, that represent the different alarms will change depending on the state of the alarm. So I'm going to go ahead and right click and I can do an acknowledge. I can also acknowledge from here as well. So if you look at this uh, column here, this is, uh, this is the acknowledgement column. So this right here is going to be ownership. So you know, we have the ability to require ownership that I talked about before where somebody actually has to take the alarm to act on it. Uh, and then this column right here, it means media. So anytime uh, this is a video camera here, we have media associated with an alarm, it will appear here and then that lets us know that we can actually go out and look at uh, a video or a media event associated to this. Then we also have states of the alarms. Um, so uh, this right here, big red, means that it's actually in alarm right now. So I'm going to go ahead and acknowledge my BOLO alarm. And then I've got a reject as well. I'm going to acknowledge that. Now my reject re requires closure, so I'm going to have to right click and close that. And then the alarm is cleared. Um, some of the other alarms we have, I, I do happen to have some video set up with this as well. So uh, with our interface with Next Level, we've associated recorded video to, to a um, particular alarm. So I have a face recognized alarm for myself. So if I do re view recorded video, so basically what's happening here is uh, I'm going to turn around. It's going to do, it's doing a face recognize on me. Um, and then I just set up to unlock the door on a face recognize. I also have a line cross alarm. We'll take a quick look at that since we have it in here. So what we have is an imaginary line basically when we've uh, set up the system drawn at the bottom of this door. So when Sharon opens the door and walks past this, that's what trips the alarm right there. So a good way to, to kind of see when people are coming in and out of the building. Okay. So I'm going to cause one more alarm here. Okay, so this is an accept bolo. So Andrew went through the door being forced and everybody thought life was good, the guy who was forcing him through the door. But we actually got an alarm back at the uh, at the operator's workstation here telling him he's got a BOLO. So as you can see right now, this particular alarm under ownership, this does require ownership. So click to take ownership. So I can't do anything with this alarm until I've actually taken ownership on it. So if I go ahead and take ownership, now I actually have the ability to acknowledge the alarm and to work with the alarm. Uh, any of the other officers or any other security operators, if they do see this alarm in their queue, they won't be able to actually act on it um, because I have ownership of it. If they have the privileges, they can override and take ownership. Um, but for the most part, you know, it's just basically saying that I have this alarm and I'm acting on this. So I'm going to go ahead and acknowledge it. Okay. So one of the last things we're going to look at here is going to be the ability to run reports. So I'm going to open up a report window here. And I'm just going to run a, a quick report here for alarm events. So I'm going to set this back a day so I get a day's worth. Oh, I'm sorry, that was an alarm history. So the alarm history basically is showing me a count of alarms. So you can see I've had eight bolos. Uh, I've had break room directionals, 14 of those. I've had 19 panic alarms. If we do an actual alarm event report, which is kind of what I meant to do there, I'm going to go back a day on that. All right. So this is, a, this is a pretty typical report that you would see uh, operators run. This is going out and telling me all the active 
alarm events that have occurred um, when I've reset them, et cetera. So I've actually got four pages of alarms here, and this is for the last day. Um, but you can see I'm getting a reject alarm uh, telling me who it actually was, the source name, where it actually occurred, uh, and, a, and a description for that particular alarm. Um, once I've run this alarm, I can, you know, print the alarm. I can uh, save it in multiple different ways. You know, I can do Excel's, PDFs, XML files, uh, and text files as well. And then the last report that we're going to show here is going to be a comments and reasons report. So this is good for your SOP procedures. This could, uh, you know, incorporate this in your SOP, and this is going to give you the ability to actually see what the uh, the officer or the operator themselves actually specified happened when they processed the uh, the alarm here. So you can see this is these are the uh, the text comments that they actually put in. And then we can define reasons as well. So I've defined a false alarm reason since this was, these were all tests. And of course, this, uh, this particular alarm could be, uh, report could be saved and emailed as well. OK. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, unmute everybody. And um, we can have some questions, if we have any. that to it. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Did I not do it? Hold on. Well, I'm having some problems here. Let me unmute you guys. Okay, wait. That's better. There we go. Everybody, I'm uh, a little technical difficulty here. Okay. There's a question right there. There's a question on the toolbar. Why not help out the toolbar? There's a question. Uh, right here. Yep. Ah. Okay. Okay. So I, I have a question dialogue open here. So if, if anybody would like to ask any questions, just uh, send them to here if you don't mind. Um, are any of these features you demonstrated available in R2? Yes, actually pretty much everything I showed you um, from the demo standpoint is available in R2. Uh, the, the only things that aren't available in R2 is going to be uh, these couple screens that I showed you guys uh, on the uh, what's available in the R3 and R4 versions, but uh, basically, yeah, all everything you saw that I demonstrated is available in R2. Oh, command center. Yes, uh, so the next question I have is, can alarms communicate remotely uh, to central station remote command centers? Yes, uh, as long as you have connectivity, um, there's no problem, um, you know, uh, communicating to a remote uh, command center. In fact, uh, we, we implement that type of thing a lot. Um, you know, we'll, we may have com command centers could be located anywhere. You just got to have the connectivity to actually get to it through the network. Actually, I'm going to bring. Uh, Hi, Paul. Did that answer your question? Paul, did that answer your question? I, I'm unmuting you. Yes, it did. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Hi, Paul Nelson. I have you. I have you unmuted as well. Uh, did that answer your question? I just sent you another email. How much bandwidth needed then? 
Uh, if you're talking about if you if we're talking about just alarms, um, I have documentation I can send you on it, but it's 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 very low bandwidth when you're talking about receiving alarms within the operations queue itself. Um, but I do have documentation that I could actually send you, and I have your email from the webinar. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Paul. Okay, great. So, Carol, I am. Let me unmute you here. There you are. Hi, Carol. Oh. Okay, you should be able to talk now, Carol. If, oh, you're self-muted. Okay, well, I'll, I'll answer a question. If you'd like to uh, ask me more, uh, you can right now. I unmuted you on my end. Um, the, yes, there will be a, so I think basically what you're asking me about is uh, licensing. So there will be a limitation as far as how many workstations can that, basically what's going to happen, it's going to follow the same rules as uh, your thick client would. So if you have 10 workstation licenses currently for the thick client or fat client, um, it'll apply directly the same as it would with a browser. So uh, depending on the version of Frontier that you're running, uh, we do have um, the ability to do concurrent licensing. And what that means is once you've bought uh, up to five licenses, you'll have the ability to turn some of your licenses into concurrent licenses. So um, you have 10 licenses right now, um, so a real-world scenario with 10 licenses might be you have five workstations that you know you always have to have connect back to the system because they're, they're extremely important and they're usually connected, like say for instance, you know, security operators. So you may have five um, dedicated licenses, so you can set them up however you want once you reach five. I can say five of these licenses are dedicated, they'll always connect, but then I can since I have 10 licenses, I can take, a, I, I, may define the, I may define 20 licenses or workstations, or I'm sorry, 20 workstations in the system and say five of these are dedicated, the rest of the 15 are going to be concurrent, and it's first come, first serve. So basically to have that ability, you've got to at least, uh, you know, reach five uh, licenses to be able to do concurrent. <laughs> All right, great. All right, thanks, Carol. All right, so, uh, did, did anybody else have any questions? Uh, if you do, just go ahead and type them in there and I'll, I'll answer as best as possible. All right, guys, well, I think that, uh, I think that's about it. Well, thank you everybody for your time. I really appreciate it um, and, uh, you know, if, if anybody, if anybody needs to ask any more questions, um, you can get a hold of me at Matrix. Um, I think I, my my email. I'll put it up here. Yeah, I don't have it anywhere on here, but it's uh, Mark Heinzman at matrixsys com. So, if anybody would like to get a hold of me or shoot me an email, ask any questions, go ahead. Uh, but otherwise, thank, thanks everybody for taking the time and uh, have a good afternoon.